Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Cornavale, co-founder of Fast Graphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, and one of the founding partners of the Dividend Kings Marketplace Service on Seeking Alpha. My title of this video today is Valuation is Science, Not Art. You know, I'm known as Mr. Valuation by many of you, and one of my pet peeves that really just gets my blood boiling, to be honest about it, because I've dedicated my whole life to valuation and trying to understand valuation, and even building what I consider to be perhaps the best valuation tool available on the planet, and I intend to make it a lot better than it currently is, and I'm, of course, referring to fast graphs, is that valuation is a science because it's based on mathematics, okay? And the idea here is really probably best understood by thinking about the famous Ben Graham metaphor in the short run, the market's a voting machine. This is where people really make a mistake. They look at market value, which is votes. You know, it's a liquid market. People can, you know, bid the price of a stock up by just excessive demand. And that's the vote in the short run, the market's a voting machine. But numerous studies have proven that in the long run, mean reversion will occur. In other words, Ben Graham went on to say, in the long run, the market is a weighing machine. In other words, it's the fundamental value of the business, the weight, if you will, of the business that creates value. So there's a scientific reality that is primarily based on mathematics and simple mathematics, I might add, that allows you to understand valuation. When you deny that, you begin diluting yourself. You're chasing market price. And I did an article once years ago titled Stock Prices Are Pathological Liars, but they can lie for a long time. And I'll give you some examples of that throughout the video. But without talking about, about it a lot more, I want to try to, with this video, express how the mathematics of valuation make it a science and not an art form, as some people contend. Now, I will talk a little bit about forecasting because I don't even like to use the word forecasting as an art for, form. The problem with forecasting is forecasting, okay? So what I'm also going to be showing in this video is historical realities of valuation are factual and based on factual data. Forecasting values of stock prices are based on forecasts, and therefore that gets a little more esoteric. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, when time passes and we're looking at hindsight, we'll once again discover, as we always have, that valuation is a science and it is based on the mathematical realities of what you're getting as an investor when you make an investment in a stock at a given valuation level. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to utilize the Dow Jones Industrial Average as the model here. I'm going to pick some stocks out of the, out of the Dow Jones because what I want you to see here, and I want to focus on the mathematics, the price-earnings ratio is one way that we measure stocks' value. And so I've got the price-earnings ratio here. And the reason Boeing doesn't have a price-earnings ratio is because it's losing money. Again, that's mathematics. Intel only trades at 11 times earnings, but that translates into an earnings yield of 8.85%. And those of you who follow my work know that I'm looking for at least 65 or 7 because that's the average rate of return that stocks deliver, and it's the minimum amount of return that I would expect as an investor by buying a stock. If I can't get 65 or 7%, then I really don't you know, want to be involved in the stock. But the bigger earnings yield I can get, the better. I'd rather have 8.5% than 6.5%. Rather have 10.5%. But the point is, there's not a lot of that. Now, you know, you don't have to go too far down the Dow Jones here to determine where you don't have enough, you know, a six and a half or seven percent earnings yield. It really stops here with Amgen, which will be one of the first stocks I want to talk to you about. But the point is, it's the inverse of the P.E. ratio that I'm really focused on, which is the earnings yield. The P.E. ratio just allows me to graphically present that to you via the fast graph. So let's start. Let's take a look at Amgen. Now, here's the key point about this. Valuation is functionally related to the multiple of earnings or the earnings yield, the current earnings yield you're getting when you buy the stock, but it's also related to the future earnings yield. And the amount of money you can expect to make on the investment is going to be directly related to how much growth, the actual compounding factor that the company is capable of generating going forward. And the whole key to valuation is to identify a company or companies that you know, grow at a rate that's attractive to you as an investor, and then make sure that you're investing in that company at a sound valuation so you can fully participate in the growth. Now, this Amgen example is a really good example to, to start with because I'm using the time frame here since the beginning of 2010, okay, or the end of 09, as you see here. 
And the stock is slightly undervalued here based on the orange line representing the fair value. But here's the key. The business has grown at 10.1% a year. This is the mathematical scientific realities evaluation. So as an investor in this company, what I'm trying to do is buy the stock so that I can participate in this 10% growth, and that's going to generate a capital appreciation component for me. However, if the stock pays the dividend, and in this case, two years later, Amgen starts paying a dividend, I'm also going to get the dividend yield in addition to the growth, okay? So if I look here, by just looking at this graph and recognizing that I've got a 10% grower and seeing that it was slightly undervalued at the beginning and, you know, fairly valued at the end, if you will, or a touch in the orange line, I know that my rate of return is going to be a little better than 10%. And the faster this growth rate is, the bigger that number is going to be. So if I just quickly re go to performance here, I want you to notice that a $10,000 investment in December of 2009 would have grown to $44,422 by the end of yesterday's closing price. That's a 14% growth component, annualized rate of return, growth only, no dividends. Okay, now I'm not reinvesting dividends here, although I could with the fast graphs. I could simply go into my additional settings and reinvest the dividends and then apply that setting and run the calculation. But I'm trying to measure the pure performance of the stock here, how much I got from income, how much I got from growth, rather than combining the two, which then clouds the water just a little bit. So I've got 14% growth. What that means is I've participated fully in the operating results that this business has generated on my behalf historically. Therefore, if I take price off of the graph, just to give you a perspective, this is the operating performance of the business, and it's grown, and I'm, I'm calculating all the way out to here, at 10% a year. Okay, so I know that when I put the price on here and see that the price is slightly below the intrinsic value line, or in other words, the orange line in this graph. So I'm obviously, you can see this is a quintessential example where the price has really tracked earnings quite well, quite closely here. There's always the short-term volatility. Stock prices are volatile. Some of these moves are actually bigger than you might think, by the way, just by you know glancing at the graph. That's a 20% drop. You know, they some people would classify that as a recession, if you will. But you can see that the price has gone. But the point is, you by underpaying it, you not only participated in the full growth of the business, you actually got a little bit of leverage. Now let me shorten this by a couple of years to make another point. Here you know, I've now got an 11% grower. So I go into my performance and now I've averaged 15.7% plus dividends pushes me out to the 17.4. But the point is I'm participating fully in the value of the business. Now, let me see if I can get this correct here. Let me try to take three more years off of this graph just to make a point. So now I've got it overvalued. Here, my growth rate is 9%. So I'm starting at overvalued and I'm going to fair value. So I'm expecting less than 9% capital appreciation and I've got 7.4. Okay, valuation matters and it matters a lot. By simply overpaying for this stock, you know, for Amgen in the, at the end of 2014, if you will, I simply took away the ability to participate in that 9% growth. I only captured 7.4% of the growth because I slightly overpaid. Now, valuation doesn't mean you're going to lose money, and that's one thing a mistake people make. But it does mean that I'm not fully participating in the value of the business, and that's what I want to get clear. Now, let's look at some more dramatic examples of that. Let me move on. Let me see if I can move on to Walmart here first. I want to come back to Coca-Cola because that's another issue that I want to talk about. But if I look at Walmart here, Walmart's very interesting because I really want to focus on this period right here. So I'm going to use my scroll bar and get rid of the forecasting. And I want to focus on Walmart as a growth stock from the period 2001 through the end of 2012. I want you to see clearly that this company was growing by 11% a year there. That's tremendous growth. 
the dividend, which they started paying in 2002, grew every single year. You can see that. So what I've got here is great operating results. I've got a great business. And this is a point I tried to make you know, so often. I've got a great business here, but if I overpay for even the greatest businesses on the planet, and this is double A rated Walmart, you know, 40% debt, one of the highest quality companies in the world, inarguably, in my opinion, at least. And a company gave me impeccable results by overpaying for it. Instead of getting 11%, rate of return, I end up with 2.3% growth. Okay, I still made money. I didn't lose money investing in Walmart over this time. But this is the science of valuation, the mathematics. By overpaying for this great company, I ended up taking a tremendous operating business that give, gave me 11% growth and turned it into a 2.3% capital appreciation. I did get some dividends that pushed me all the way to 3.4%, but woohoo, you know, is that really a great investment? So I couldn't have found a more impeccable company back then. It went through both recessions, I want you to notice, as if they weren't even there. They actually grew and, you know, earnings grew, and then even their dividend grew during the Great Recession. So there was nothing fundamentally wrong with this company. Valuation matters. It matters a lot. You were massively overpaying for even the greatest stock on the planet. And what it did was it took a great investment potentially and turned it into a lousy investment simply because, you know, you overpaid for it. And, and that's the issue that I want to keep, you know, talking about. Now, on the flip side of that, you got a name like Walgreens Boots Alliance here. I'm looking at free cash flow now. I'm using a little different metric. I've been using adjusted operating earnings, but I've got access to all these different metrics here. I got operating earnings, which I typically look at. I've got diluted earnings, which are gap, which many people, many of you talk about saying, how come my numbers are different? Because they're usually looking at gap or diluted, and I'm looking at operating. But I also got cash flow, and now what I've got on this graph is actually free cash flow. Okay, and I'm looking at free cash flow yield here. Because Walgreens Boots Alliance is so inexpensive, I'm buying it with an 8.15% free cash flow yield. That's tremendous. Notwithstanding, I got a 3.5% dividend yield. My free cash flow payout ratio here is only around 40%. So, you know, here's a case where the fundamentals are supporting my investment. The stock price has not been participating. This has been a losing stock for four or five years, but they also had fundamental weakness over that period of time. I do want to point that out. But now what's happening is the market overshoots and the reversion to the mean clearly, at least in my opinion, and you know what I'm seeing clearly on paper here mathematically is the stock is reverting to the mean and moving back into alignment with fair value. So this becomes a very attractive investment based on free cash flow alone, you know, looking to the future in only 4.68% free cash flow growth. But because I can buy this company at a discount, even over the next year or so, which is really, I don't like to go out too far with estimates because the further out you get, the more cloudy the future obviously is. But I've got a 28% annualized rate of return if this company would move, you know, back to a normal you know, free cash flow or back to free cash flow alignment. Normal multiple of cash flow has been about 12.6. It currently trades at 12.27. So it's virtually in line with that. That would still give me a 13, 12.8% annualized rate of return if it trades at just a normal multiple of free cash flow. Valuation is mathematics. It's not science. Now, where the art form comes, as I mentioned to you earlier, is whether or not these are accurate forecasts or not. That's where it gets really tricky. And that's where valuation turns into somewhat of an art form where you've got to apply judgments, so you've got to do research, and you've got to try to cooperate and decide whether or not the forecasts are okay. You know, I start with analyst scorecards. I've talked about that quite a bit. That's why we give them. How good have the analysts been at forecasting and predicting you know, the stock and, you know, how good is their record? Has it been, you know, in the case of Walgreens Boots Alliance, analysts get it right most of the time. So that would give me some, you know, comfort when I'm looking at forecasts. But the key point is, you know, the future is somewhat subjective and esoteric because the only thing certain about the future is uncertainty. You know, in other words, we're forecasting, we're making guess. We need to be within a reasonable range of correctness, not perfection. You're not going to get perfection. But what the historical graphs do, just as we saw with Amgen and some of the others here, the historical graphs 
prove beyond a shadow of doubt. They give me, you know, extremely valid evidence that valuation matters and that valuation is mathematics. I want to just be clear about this. When I'm looking at historical data here, I've got real evidence, factual mathematical realities that valuation works when I look at a case like Amjet. Now, having said that, then we run into some you know, exceptions to every rule. And one of the things that we're working on with fast graphs right now, we don't quite have it figured out, but we're getting close thanks to some consulting I've done with a, a really an expert in understanding financial statements, Bill Kay, who's uh, going to be working with us on the fast grass value you Academy, where we're going to be teaching financed individual investors. You might want to watch for that, especially on our YouTube channel. One of the things you're going to see a lot of companies like Coca-Cola, Colgate, PepsiCo would be another example companies that have historically traded at a very high premium. Now, a clue to that would be branding. Okay, the brand has value. And Coca-Cola is one of the more valuable brands on the planet. You can actually go to websites like Statistica and see what the brand value is, divide that by the number of shares and see the extra value that the market might give to a Coca-Cola. But here's the point that does not change the reality that valuation is a science and based on mathematics because let's look at some of the realities here let me shorten the time frame on this coke graph let me shorten it one more year and you know i'm looking at a normal fair value of 20 okay now that's been what coca-cola has traded at but coca-cola has only grown earnings at a rate of about five percent a year so i have starting out at normal value here. I won't call it fair value. And I'm a little bit overvalued here. So I'm going to get a rate of return that's going to be somewhere in the 6% range, 5% plus a little bit of PE ratio expansion. So I come out, I'm looking at exactly 6.1%. It's the mathematics of valuation, the mathematical realities. Because I started out at a reasonable fair value given the brand value of a Coca-Cola because it still correlates with the earnings growth. I did get a little bit of a premium here, but I ended up getting only slightly better than the company's actual operating results. If I take a couple of more years off of here, now, you know, I've got the stock growing at 4.56%. I check my performance, I'm down to 5.8%. There's a mathematical reality here, but I also only have an earnings yield of 3.71%. The point is growth and value are also related and very important. So when I've got growth at 45 or 5%, that simply means that I'm going to get, you know, that as a capital appreciation component plus some dividend income. And, you know, when you look at this from a performance point of view, I got my 5.8% capital appreciation at this time frame I'm showing you here, but I blew that up to 7.8% because of the dividend and the dividend yield. And by the way, valuation can also be measured on by looking at dividend yield. The higher the dividend yield, you know, the better. Here, I would have started out with a 2.57% dividend yield. Today, I've got 3.08%, but back here, this is an analytical tool, and you ought to be analyzing these investments, including valuation. I have a dividend payout ratio of 52%. Here, I've got a dividend payout ratio of 84%, mostly not because the dividend has, you know, that they've given me a much larger portion of earnings in dividends as a policy, perhaps, but because the earnings have flattened out and even dropped. You know, I went from $2.01 worth of earnings down to $1.95. So I've actually had negative earnings growth here, which actually expanded my dividend payout ratio. So I've got a higher yield here, but the company's giving more dividend income. Now, when I look at forecasting, and I look at the fact that this company maybe is expected to grow a little faster than it historically has, if I go back to a, my normal multiple, which is the premium value, I can expect to make, you know, the five or six percent rate of return, six or seven percent even rate of return. If I go out further, that Coca-Cola has normally generated. But the point is, I'm taking a higher risk for that rate of return than I would be, for example, if I was investing in something such as. Walgreens Boots Alliance, and I'm going to actually switch this to operating earnings, where if I was looking at Walgreens Boots Alliance with a much higher earnings yield, that's the key. The earnings yield here is 8.57% and look at forecasting and even look at a discounted PE of only 13, I can make 20% rates of return 
with only 6% growth, where I was expecting actually higher growth with Coca-Cola. If I can go back to it, I was expecting higher growth with Coca-Cola, but I expect a much lower rate of return because of the science, because of the mathematics of valuation. So the point is, valuation matters and matters a lot. This de-risks my portfolio, but it also leverages it from the point of view that I could get some P.E. ratio expansion. I go back to a 15 P.E. with the Walgreens Boots Alliance, and I can make very you know, staggering 33 plus percent rates of return over the next year and a half. And let's test that again. Let's look at the historical realities of Walgreens Boots Alliance. And what you see is that historically, the company has traded above a 15 PE numerous times. It's traded at a 15 PE numerous times. And it looks to me like it's heading back to a, a normal PE. Now, when I go back to the forecasting, this defaults automatically when I use the normal PE calculator to the five-year normal. But if I look at this from all the histories, you can see there's even periods where we've had very high PEs. But a 14 or 15 PE would not be unacceptable. Even I'll do the 14 and a half here, would not be outlandishly aggressive in my forecast. And again, I would have the opportunity to make 30% rates of return by doing that. The point is valuation matters, and it matters a lot. So let's go ahead now and let's look at Apple, which I you know, talk about all the time because I just want to continue to make this point. Valuation matters. In the long run, the market reverts to the mean. What I've got here is I've got absolute historical evidence, reality evidence that this stock has historically traded at a 15-ish PE. Every now and then the PE gets a little higher, Every time it did, it reverted to the mean. When it got lower, these were the great times to buy the stock. But it's also telling me that you would have, you know, historically many opportunities to be able to buy this stock. Now, this is during a period of time when growth has averaged 13.95%. We'll call it 14%. Now, all of a sudden, we've got this separation. This is the voting machine that Ben Graham talked about. Apple is still the great company it's, it, was, it has been all during this time. There's no question about that. It's grown at 14%. When I look at forecasting on the stock, it's expected to grow at 10% over the next couple of years. The three to five year growth, however, is expected to be 14%. But if that's the case and this stock reverts back to a 15 PE, I'm facing the potential for loss in this example investing in perhaps the greatest company on the planet, I could be exposing myself to loss and I'm taking great risk because all it's going to take is some catalyst that says, hey, Apple's overvalued and, you know, the tech stock bubble because a lot of these stocks, you know, I also talked about names like, you know, Applied Materials, which is, I'll call it a peer of Apple. When you look at these other, all these tech stocks right now, you see this same picture. You see these normal valuations and now you've got this separation. These companies are simply becoming expensive. You know, it's just that simple. Now, that doesn't change the beauty of the company. That doesn't change the growth potential these companies have. That doesn't change what the quality is. It doesn't change their management. What it changes is you are being a greater fool by investing in these stocks now on, only on the basis that a fool greater than you is going to come and pay you more. But the critical point is you're not buying the stock in such a manner that positions you to participate in its growth like you can when you're buying the stock at a reasonable valuation. These tech stocks are expensive today. They're great companies, you know, highly rated, reasonable debt levels, good historical long-term growth rates, and even very attractive forecasting growth rates, I might add. But that doesn't make them great. It makes them riskier investments than you should be taking. I hope you got the essence that valuation matters and it matters a lot. And I hope you understand that there is an actual mathematical reality in science behind this thing called valuation. It's been Chuck Harville saying thanks for watching. If you like this, you know, ring the bell, give me a like, subscribe to the channel. You know, we got a lot more videos coming. We got some really exciting videos coming later on this year as well. Thanks for watching.